Hey guys, I'm back with the mitochondria and the chloroplast. And as you can see, these two are going to deal with a little bit of energy. Um, when we think about cells' need for power, you know, they have to make energy. They do this by taking in food and digesting it oftentimes. Uh, they also have to have the oxygen present. Um, they want to make ATPs remove waste. But the whole purpose of mitochondria chloroplast, no matter if you're a plant or an animal, is to create ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Remember, the energy stored in the bonds of these ATP molecules that can be released later on whenever we need it. Now, when we're making energy, there's a slight um, similarity you need to know between the mitochondria and the chloroplast. They both create ATP. Uh, the mitochondria turns glucose, which is sugar, to ATP. And chloroplast takes the sunlight's energy and converts it to ATP and to carbohydrates. You know, ATP is energy that we're going to be actively using at the time by breaking the bonds. And carbohydrates are what we will use to store the energy for later. Starch in animals and glycogen in, excuse me, starch in plants and glycogen in animals. Now, when we look at the mitochondria and the chloroplast, there's some similarities about them that we need to know. They both transform energy in the form of ATP. They both are double membrane structures, which means they have two membranes. They are semi-autonomous, which means these two organelles, the mitochondria and chloroplasts, could actually live independently of one another. They have their own DNA. They divide. They change shape. Um, they have their own internal ribosomes. They have enzymes, um, which is going to lead to a theory that you're going to see at the end. Let's talk about the mitochondria first. The mitochondria's main function is to deal with cellular respiration, which is what you and I do. We take in oxygen. We use that oxygen to break down the food that we've eaten to release the energy that's there that we can help sustain life. So they use oxygen to generate ATPs by breaking down the food that we eat. And when you do that, it's called aerobic respiration. Now, we can also break down food in the absence of oxygen, but for right now, we're just concerned with aerobic respiration. Now, when you look at the mitochondria, um, there's, it has a unique structure. I often think of it as a kidney bean with little lines in it. Um, it is double membrane. It has a smooth outer membrane and a highly folded inner membrane called the cristae. Uh, the cristae, the more folds it has, it increases the surface area so that you can have more enzymatic activity, therefore increase more energy. So why does it have two membranes anyway? It has that to increase the activity of the, the enzymes. Um, the mitochondria has its own DNA, like I said, its own ribosomes, and its own enzymes. Now here's a picture. Here's a cartoon picture on the left and an actual picture on the right, and you can see the folds and how they work. Now, the last thing on the mitochondria I want to talk about is that almost every eukaryotic cell has mitochondria, even plants. Now, we oftentimes don't think about plants having mitochondria, but think about it. Plants still have to produce energy whenever there's not sunlight there. So uh, plants also have mitochondria. So that's a little misconception you need to know. Um, and the number of mitochondria determines is determined by what the cell actually does. For example, the question here I pose is what cells would have a lot of mitochondria? A cell that needed more energy would have more mitochondria, such as your heart cell would have more mitochondria than a skin cell. Your muscle cell would have more mitochondria than a bone cell. A cell that needs more energy will have more mitochondria. Uh, when we talk about chloroplasts, chloroplasts are plant organelles. We usually link them to plants. And they are there's a class of plant structures called plastids. There's three types, and chloroplast belongs to one of those three types. But I want to go over them briefly. There's the ameloplast which basically store starch and they're colorless. There's the chromoplasts, which store pigments such as yellow and orange. That's the pretty ones you see during the, the autumn leaf change color. Um, and they're, they're found in fruits and flowers a lot of times. And then the chloroplasts, the one we're focusing on, they're green, of course, because they contain chlorophyll and they function in photosynthesis. Now, why are they green? Just so you know, they're green because of this picture over here on the right-hand side. Right here tells the story. You know, the light spectrum is made up of Roy, G, Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Well, chloroplasts are green because they absorb all the light spe all the colors of the light spectrum except for green. Green is reflected. 
All right. Now, how are mitochondria and chloroplasts different uh, from other organelles in the cell? They're different because they're not a part of the endomembrane system, you know, which we learned about yesterday, which is the, the vacuoles, the ER, uh, the Golgi apparatus, the lysosome, etc. Um, they grow and reproduce on their own. They're semi-autonomous. They can do it simply by themselves. They, they would leave the cell if it, if it wasn't for other reasons. Uh, they have their own circular chromosomes, their own circular DNA, which is very similar to bacteria. You know, so when I pose the question down here in the bottom, who else has a circular chromosome not bound by a nucleus? You know, you automatically got to think about uh, bacteria. So there's some type of link going on between mitochondria and chloroplasts. It's different than everything else. And when you think about that link, you have to think about the endosymbiotic theory. Now, what this basically states was um, that the mitochondria and chloroplasts were individual prokaryotes at one time, and an ancient eukaryote, I mean, an ancient eukaryote ingested the mitochondria and ingested uh, an aerobic uh, energy-producing prokaryote, and they started to live symbiotically. So one supplied the energy, the mitochondria supplied the energy, and the other one supplied raw materials and protection. That would be the eukaryotic organism. It's providing protection for the mitochondria and it's providing what it eats, raw materials, so the mitochondria doesn't have to go searching for it. And over time, they developed into one organism. Now, it's also believed that one of these organisms at some time absorbed or uh, consumed a chloroplast, and that's how the plant eukaryotes developed, uh, was the same way. Uh, this lady down here, Lynn Mary Gellis, um, she is from the University of Maryland, Maryland uh, Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, she's no longer with us. She actually died um, November 2011, but she's credited with actually publishing the first endosymbiotic theory. Now, she got her work from other people before her, but she's accredited with it. And believe it or not, she was turned down a lot of times before she actually got it published. Um, and this is just a representation of what happened. And like I said, we started out with a ancestral prokaryote, all right, and over time it ingested a mitochondria, all right, and then it, it developed in what we consider the ancestor of heterotrophic eukaryotes. And that same one might have went on another pathway and ingested chloroplasts, these plastids, and it became the ancestor of photosynthetic eukaryotes. So that's kind of like what the endosymbiotic theory means. I hope this helps you with mitochondria and chloroplasts, and I will talk to you later.